Hey, everybody, and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know. We are a podcast about the classical world, old books, old art, old philosophy, old things. Basically, we're trying to make the classical world accessible to normal people in a way that doesn't feel awful for everyone. <laughs> my name is AJ Hindenburg, and I am joined by Graham Donaldson. Wait, how come you mock my intro and... That was extremely that was great, fluid. That AJ, was, that was a great a really intro. I just want to thank say thank you. For, th- thank you for the thought that went into that introduction. I appreciate it. Hey, Graham, do better. Okay. <laughs> I'm here with Graham Donaldson. Hello. I'm also here with Thomas Magby. Hi. And we do a we, I used to say we all come from the same school, but we don't anymore. No, nope, we don't. Thomas is catching the bad guys. And uh-huh. But you two are still... Well, uh, we're still doing a thing. Do yeah. better is such an aggravating phrase. Did what, you say do ag- better? Aggregating or aggravating? Aggravating. Do better? Like, oh, what, 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 I, there's nothing that just pushes my buttons. Does it get under your skin? It does. Really? It does. Can I'm I find just, a couple? Over the course there, of this episode, I'm going to find more. This is There's great. something about that phrase, do better, that just drives me bonkers. I'm so excited. I just yeah. find it so insulting. Are there any yeah. others? Because I'd like to know uh, all of them. Probably. I okay. don't know what they are off okay. the top of my head, but there's just something about, like, do better that's just, like, the... the and. I don't know, there's, it just has did like that, this... Did that sort of dig into you? A little bit. It's, yeah. it's like, the, it's like the, 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 the looking down the nose more... Uh, it, just, it just grinds my goats. Hey, Graham, I thought you did a great job in well, your Thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah. You, you did better. I mean, grind You me. did it. Yeah. You, you did it. But not last time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, I didn't even ask you what your thing is about, so I have no pun. That's all right. It's about money. Oh, I did ask you what your thing is about. <laughs> you <laughs> we told just me I forgot. That. <laughs> wow. Hi, you guys. Wow. We, we really are back it in the hurts. saddle. <laughs> yeah. We are back in fine form. Incredible. I couldn't make sense of it. No, 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 no. See, there you go. Yeah. Oh, there's, your, there's your money. Pun. Okay, I see. Yep. Okay. Take it to the bank. All right. <laughs> Oh, uh, are we do that this whole episode too? I don't know. The I hope so. I'm okay with that. Um, well, we yeah. So what we're going to talk about today is it's kind of I was going to say a thought experiment. But that's last episode. Hey, but it is it is a framework that I give my students to help think about um, sort of eras of history. And like all frameworks, it's it's not perfect, but it is kind of helpful. Um, and so. Um, and it's, it's a framework of thinking about history in regards to major eras of how we have used money in society. That's kind of the framework for it. And um, so in classical education, I, I was looking into this, in, in the history of classical education, actually the, the, um, the queen of the sciences in classical education has always been theology. So theology has been the queen of the sciences. It was supposed to be the, the, th- the organizing principle of all of education going back to the Middle Ages and whatnot. And one of the last things that you would study as a educated person of antiquity was um, uh, was was politics, government, and money and economics. And the reason for that being was they wanted you to be the moral man, the good person, before you went into these fields. Right? They wanted you to have a knowledge of history and ethics and philosophy and theology and music and astronomy and all. And all the the quadrivium and trivium, um, and then you could go into sort of like the servile arts or like the practical things of being someone who was going to govern or someone who was going to rule or someone who was going to have the power that money bestows. So, so uh, economics ends up being kind of like one of the last things that you learn in classical education because it was supposed to be the all right. You've got all this stuff. You've been formed as a human, and now here is the arena that you're going to go into, and if you're going to go off and be in the public sphere, kind of thing. Um, was the danger that teaching them money too early would make them avaricious? I think so. And greedy? Yeah, yeah. And right, they focus um, on it too much rather than their actual development. Yeah, or when you get into something that can now you can go off into the world and you can kind of like make a living doing this the the need of going back and doing like the, the primary things is mm. no longer needed because you're like well I can stand on my own two feet why do I need to go back and like learn about music sure um, or whatever um, anyway I, I don't know if we we don't do this on purpose but at, at our school uh, we have a, their fourth year history um, class is a government and economics course and um, and I've been teaching it this year so I've been having my head um, all up in thinking about like what is a government so we do play as republic and we do um but then also the, the second semester we've been doing economics and when you're designing a course you have a big decision to make do you go and get a textbook or not uh i am someone who's pretty anti-textbook uh, i don't like textbooks um but anyway so but that that means that you do need to give some kind of framework to students to sort of think about whatever concept you're doing and sort of economics um so i came up with this uh, a sort of a, it's not like a back of the envelope, but it's a, it's an easy mental model to think about sort of the eras that human beings have had with 
basically technological innovations regarding money, and it, it can help sort of frame your understanding of history. Um, uh, when I was, you guys probably had the same experience, when I was learning like a history class, um, discussions about like money or the economic realities of a people was never talked about. It was always like, so for example, the French Revolution. When I was taught the French Revolution, it was always, this was the culmination of like the Enlightenment and all of these new philosophies of, you know, the uh, like, like Locke and Hobbes and Rousseau coming together and people getting all geeked up and realizing we don't need kings anymore. I was never taught that France had gone absolutely bankrupt 60 years before that. Um, because John Law basically lost the entire wealth of France on a, on a, a stock bubble scheme because he wanted to buy Louisiana or because of Louisiana. Um, right. Like, and you can really trace this line between the bankruptcy of France and then a generation later, the cutting off of the King's Mm. head. But when, you know, but it's, that's, I don't know if it's like considered a little bit too difficult or maybe it's like one element too much. So when you're in 10th grade history, you learn about you learn about the social contract and then all of a sudden you have the French Revolution right. and you don't learn about John Law's um, Louisiana bubble and the bankruptcy of the French crown for whatever reason. Anyway. So you think there's like an overemphasis on the ideas that lead into those I think events. so. Or I think when you're making a decision, okay, how do I make – how if I'm going to teach something, how do I make it – easier, uh, there are things you're going to remove. And I think for whatever reason, a lot of economic history has been the thing that we have said, well, we can superimpose this on history later. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, that, and that's probably fair. In fact, if I would, um, um, but there is something about when you have a working model of how the monetary side of human society has developed, when you can have that and superimpose that over history, you do get a lot of some, it basically ends, I feel like it ends up being another harmony that fits into a melody or maybe even is the melody that fits into a bunch of different harmonies. When you can take some kind of, when you can understand the economic side of human history, it does bring some things that maybe have only, we're able to only be explained by saying they really liked the social contract and that's why they killed the king when there's actually other, other factors at play like, a generation of bankruptcy. Um, anyway, so um, there's there's another sort of school of thought about history where you can also look at it in terms of the technological changes of energy consumption. That as as the way that societies have used different means of energy, that has that has been a driver of the of the movements of history. So as you go from like like slave labor of the ancient world to like whale oil of the 19th century to petroleum of the 20th like you you know there's there's another way of using that to to superimpose over the the study of history so anyway what i want to do in this episode is just offer up kind of easy little three stages of monetary history um and try to give a reason as to why those stages why the second stage came from the first and why the third stage came from the second as another little framework the, to understand um, sort of the grand moves of, of, of history. That's kind of the, that's the, uh, the idea. All is right. This, is this all an excuse for you to talk about crypto in the, in the, and then at the end we're talking about Bitcoin boys. No, uh, yeah. it's the future. Yeah. Um, no. Okay. Um, anyway, it's weird to think of like money as technology or, or as an innovation, but that's kind of what it is. Um, if there, if we're going to, oh man, and I'm just going to keep talking about thought experiments, but here's the thought experiment. Like, okay. um, what what came first like the chicken no no the egg the, the chicken oh, my word. Yeah. <laughs> no like um the um, egg is a chicken so technically the chicken is correct right we're in agreement oh, my word. Yeah, thank you. Job, okay next question um i guess it's like what was the, what was the first innovation on money was it like well i mean money is the first like so in Aristotle's conception, you start with bartering, and then the fact that you can abstract that bartering into like some other currency. Like, yeah. That's the first. Is that, is that what you're saying? What's your question? What's the first well, money? I guess it's like what, I mean, um, either someone came up with the idea that we can have 
that yeah, that bartering is too difficult. I think that that's one way. Is that bartering is too difficult, and so we are now going to create sort of an avatar of our barter yep. and, and 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 ascribe value to that, and that's money. Right. AJ, you've tried. You've been to a bartering festival before, right? It's rough. And uh, <laughs> oh, I mean, that's rough. How you can't? How, why is, why it, is it? Why is it rough? Because not everybody everybody wants what you've got. Sometimes I take I take pottery, and I'm like, ooh, I really want that, you know, olive oil or whatever it is. And they're like, yeah, but I don't need, I don't need pottery. And you're like, oh. <laughs> Okay, uh, bye, bye. I guess. Yeah. Uh, I did learn that if you taking tools is a big hit, mm-hmm. like an axe. Yeah. Everybody wants an axe. But if you took like a giant diamond, I couldn't. I couldn't buy like a pair of sandals. Yeah, well, you right? go with some guy who's selling sandals would want to do it. Yeah, he'd, he'd be. He want that mm-hmm. trade, but I would never want. But to if make you that want trade. that guy's sandals and this guy's olive oil and that guy's axe, they're not going to be able to divide that diamond. Right, and that guy's not going to want to throw in his house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To make the diamond <laughs> to make thing the, work. The, Right to make the deal whole. Yeah. That's right. So, so that could be the, the 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 genesis of money is you have that bartering problem, and so we say, oh, we need something that is divisible, right. and and we all agree that you know we can use money in that sense. So, what was the first one? Was it shells? Well, the or? other the other. Uh, oh, it could be shells, or I mean, at that point, it doesn't really matter. It needs to be rare enough that it's not everywhere. Right. So you can't just pick it up. And yeah. but it needs to be um, and well, probably useful in some way. Well, there, there needs to be a couple of things. It can't decay. So you don't want money that like rusts over time. Sure. Um, it needs to be divisible. So you need money that is easily divisible. It needs to be so easily, somewhat verifiable. Yeah. So um, uh, hard to counterfeit. So that's one of the arguments why gold was a thing because it has weight and and, um, and you can purify it in fire and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you bite it to see if it's yeah. real. Um, so, th- that, so that's sort of, I think, what you say was Aristotle? Yeah. So Aristotle posits that. The other option is that it wasn't money that was created first, but it was the idea of credit or a futures contract that was created first. Oh, hey, so if yeah, go ahead. So if that guy wants my diamond, he can give me a pair of sandals now, and then he can give me a pair of sandals for the next 50 years, and then he can earn that Either diamond. that or probably like more an agricultural thing. Like I want to grow a field of corn. I have no corn. You have some corn seed. If you give me a corn, like a handful of enough corn seed to plant an acre of corn, I will give you a tenth of whatever I grow. Right. And you've now created basically a future contract, or you've created credit in, in, in a certain sense. Mm-hmm. And so maybe that was the innovative idea where someone was, uh, um, or, or it came out of bargaining. Whichever one came first, whether it was the idea of money or whether it was the idea of a yeah. future payment, yeah. we don't know. But uh, eventually, the ancient world settled on a that gold was the standard right. of of exchange because it doesn't rust because it has those things it doesn't rust you can divide it it's somewhat verifiable it's rare um, but there is enough that it's not so rare that you just have like one little bit of it yeah. um, and so it's so, okay so you had a world that used gold coins and um, and there's a lot of benefits to this world let's sorry let's think through it. what are some of the benefits we have of if we have gold coins, and then we have to have some sort of other derivatives um, with that. So there was gold coins and then silver, silver coins. Silver, bronze, iron. Other, and then other groups of, of people had other, like, lesser denominated currencies to put on top of that, like like a, like a bronze coin. What's really nice is storage, mm-hmm. yeah. right? So if I want to buy something really expensive, I don't have to have, say, 20,000 chunks of iron. I can have a few hunks of gold. Exactly, yep. But if I want to buy something small, I can have, either have little tiny pieces of gold. Which is or difficult. I can have silver yep. or something smaller. So that, right. that means that all I have to carry around in my pocket is a few of each, right? Mm-hmm. A little bit of gold, a little bit of silver, a little bit of iron, and that way I can buy whatever I need to. Yep. So you, a you pastry have, and a horse. You mm-hmm. definitely, yeah, so you, you have those benefits for sure. Solves the problem from bartering of like you don't need people to be matched on their preferences. Exactly. Right? So yeah. yes, you don't need to have like a perfect storm of desire in order right. for the, the deal to go through. And an exact well, equal amount of goods. That's right. Yes, exactly. Um, when you, and then also it ha- it meant that uh, as gold was a um, was accepted in multiple places. in multiple places, it did open up the possibility for trade to make a lot more sense, right. and it was less risky because you didn't have to say like, "Well, I'm going to bring my shipload of sandals in hopes that I can buy some pepper." But if no one wants sandals, then you're screwed. But um, if you go with a bag of gold, you know that you can come back with things that you know are going to sell back home. So you can go and buy spices. Yeah. And then you can come back with your spices that you paid for with gold, and you can be, and you know you're able to sell that as opposed to trying to pay for it with sandals. So there are definitely benefits. Um, you come back with gold that is, you come back with, you know, you're a merchant in Italy, 
and you sell whatever you want in Morocco and you come back with Moroccan gold, you can't really go to like, it's, you can go to this. Yeah. You go to the streets of Italy. They may or may not care that that gold coin is stamped with whatever Moroccan government there is, right. but that coin can be melted down and it can be restamped. And that's a, that's a useful thing with gold is that it has that is, it is slightly fungible in that way that you can recast it. Um, so that is a tremendously beneficial thing, but there are some downsides to this, um, to this, this system. Um, oh, actually fun fact. Um, if you go back to one of our old episodes where we were talking about the Knights Templar, Mm -hmm. one of the ways that the Knights Templar had such power in the medieval world was that, um, gold is, again, is also kind of dangerous to move around. If you lose it, it's gone. Right. Um, and so, and if you, or if you get killed or if you get like attacked, bonds, yeah, right? if you get attacked yeah. on the highway and like, and bandits take off your gold, you are That's screwed. It. Like your yeah. gold is gone. Yeah. And so one of the powers that the, the Knights Templar had was you could, um, uh, because they were such a, a coordinated network, if you had a letter from one Knight Templar in say Portugal, you could take that letter to another Knight Templar in Jerusalem and you could, and the letter could say, you, "You give this guy ten gold coins. He's totally good for it. Love, brother, so and so, with right. his seal, right?" And that, so you have this sort of international, almost like basic banking network, which is what gave the Knights Templar so much power. Whereas, um, if you had the King of Portugal say that to the King of Jerusalem, you have a layer of doubt that didn't exist in the, in the Knights Templar uh, layer. Like they were on the same organization. Right. So you almost had this international banking right. corporation. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're going to, if you're the King of Jerusalem, you'd be like, well, what do I care what the King of uh, Portugal says? I don't even know if he's good for it. Right. I don't know if I give him my 10 gold coins and I say, Hey, make me whole so that my coffers still have 10 gold coins. If he's going to do it, no way. I'm not giving you money. Right. But the Knights Templar did that. So, um, uh, sort of, that's a great example of like a, of a, of a, of a sort of old network effect that gave a group their power. Um, but there are some downsides to a world of gold coins. Uh, can you guys think of some, what are some of the downsides? You already said some of it that like, if you, if it's stolen, then like that money is actually gone. If you're like super rich, you have to store that yep. gold somewhere and like, I'm just imagining like storehouses yep. where you just you're just holding money. So you got to store it. Um, you, the, in the, that's, that's you have vulnerable. to depend on either the person doing the stamping, or you have to depend on scales to make sure that the gold is good yeah. and that you have enough of it. Yep, yeah. you do have a counterfeit problem that needs to be that needs to be solved. Right. Um, that like can I happen. could put gold around something that's similarly heavy mm-hmm. and then try to pass that off. Right. And the only way you can really figure it out is by melting it down or trusting the stamp is from the actual king. But then people can make any kind of stamp. Yep. You know what I mean? Um, the one of the, and one of the main problems, yeah, the, 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 all of these problems end up being slightly deflationary for gold. So gold ends up if you let that system happen over time, gold the, the gold itself slowly gains in value over time with that. So there's a couple of factors. Um, yeah, so the only thing that would create would, would have gold be. Um, lose its purchasing power is if you find a lot of it all at once. And in fact, this happened to the kingdom of Spain when they went and they, the conquistadors, they um, found so much silver in a mountain in, I think it's Peru, Bolivia. Anyway, they found so much silver in one mountain. They're like, oh my goodness, we're rich that they mined so much silver that they actually had a massive inflation Mm. on silver. And it actually was one of the things that brought down the Spanish empires. They got so much gold, they inflated their currency and they didn't have the tools to be able to deal with that. Um, That's a pretty rare problem to have. Usually when you have a fixed amount of money in a system, um, that money is, well, if you're, if you're on a boat and you have the, if you're a merchant and you do a massive purchase and you have a boat filled with gold and you're coming back home and your gold, gold boat sinks to the bottom of the Mediterranean, not only are you, that merchant, screwed because all your money's at the bottom, the whole system now has slightly less gold in it. Right. Now, it could be marginal, or, or but have that sl- those little chips at the monetary supply happen over time, and that means that the amount that the rest of the gold has to do is they, it needs to shoulder the burden of the economy. So that, that gold now needs to um, sort of um, 
there's, there's less supply, so the value of that gold goes up. Right. Okay, when you live in a system where the value of something has a slow creep upwards, it incentivizes people to hold on to it. Right, you don't want to spend your gold because in a couple of months it'll be worth It could be, right? More. Now, you still want to do productive things, but generally speaking, the gold, if you don't need to spend it, you're going to hold on to it because you can probably do more with it later. And if you can sink a few ships while you're at it. <laughs> sink a few <laughs> ships yeah, while you're at it. Sink a few ships full of gold, and then your gold's worth yeah. more. Yeah. So that means that you do have a little bit of a headwind against spending, albeit a sm- not one that's going to like completely tip the scales, but there is going to be a bit of a like, eh, maybe I don't want to do this risky venture because uh, my gold is maybe going to be worth more in the future. Headwind, sunken ship, nice. Yeah, thank you, appreciate <laughs> it. Um, it is probably, and now... Um, it is incredibly difficult to do massive um, endeavors in a gold system, in a pure gold system. If you want to build a giant, I don't know, anything, a castle, um, if you want to fund a massive war, if you're going to do something that requires, uh, that is uh, on a bigger scale, it's actually quite a, a logistical undertaking to do it with gold. Um, moving vast quantities of gold in a war is really dangerous. Um, moving vast quantities of gold in a peaceful building project is super dangerous. Moving vast quantities of gold ever yeah. is dangerous. So yeah. you have um, uh, the, the structure of the monetary system does, doesn't put a cap, but it makes it harder to do big building projects. And some people look at this and they say, well, maybe having a gold system like this is something that you know held back uh, uh, really big advancements for a long time in the ancient world, potentially. Well, but the thing maybe. is, Rome still did what Rome did, and you know, Rome used gold, so yeah. maybe not. Um, but it does mean that uh, it's a lot harder, uh, and it just takes a lot longer to do things because you're actually moving a physical tonnage of gold around to do it. Gold, a gold system, also has a problem in that it, um, and this is a debatable point, but I, the, it, it makes a society have a little bit of an incentive to go to war and conquest. Um, Because if you were, let's say you were a peaceful society, let's say you have a society where you have an era of well-managed government and it is peaceful and it is flourishing and people are wanting to do endeavors to increase their quality of life and people are doing endeavors, they're starting businesses, they're becoming merchants, they are building things, they are... They are, are doing things that make human life enjoyable. Um, if you have a system that has a fixed amount of, um, of currency in it, um, there's already, you know, um, it is, we've already said that it's sort of difficult to do big building ventures with a lot of gold. But if you have something that's, an, that's inherently deflationary, it does mean that at some point you can get to the era where you're actually running out of gold right. It, uh, if especially if you're doing international trade. So as the world got more, um, as trade routes became easily accessible, as shipping became less and less hazardous, like in the later Middle Ages. Gold becomes concentrated. Gold, gold, gold becomes concentrated, and um, you can have a flow where all of a sudden you there's a society that could have an existential crisis where they don't have enough gold, and they, now, they, they're, they have some incentive to go out and get it. So... Um, I think it's an overstatement to say that a fixed monetary society like gold incentivizes conflict, but I think there's something to that argument, that when you have that fixed amount of gold, you are, well, the, what the Spanish conquistadors did makes a lot of sense. They are, when there's a new continent, there is going to be a rush to go get those resources. When, um, when there is a hint that there could be gold somewhere else, there is going to be uh, a move to go and secure it be, um, because you are going to be in a better place if you do that. So there is a little bit of a um, of an incentive to be a to throw down. There's a little bit of incentive to be a nation that is willing to conquer an attack for gain. The reason I'm I'm overemphasizing it is because in um, there's an argument to be made that our current system, the one that's sort of backed by the U.S. dollar, for a long time. A lot of uh, incentivized nations to actually not go to war, mm. but we'll we'll get to that maybe at, uh, at the end. Um, but anyway, so 
When you have this fixed system, uh, a gold system is slightly deflationary. Uh, gold exits the system over time. The only t- the only time that it is inflationary is when you find mass when you find massive amounts of it. Um, but over time, uh, uh, and as, as the world becomes more interconnected, and as technology advances and international travel becomes safe, you actually don't even have enough gold supply to um, support the growth of an eco- of, the, of the global economy. Mm-hmm. It's just um, there needs to be some sort of innovation to make things easier. Well, I was going to say is the more of us there are, the harder it is to have gold be the thing that is the standard. That's right. Yeah. Um, and so there was an innovation that made things easier. Um, and that was to still have gold be the basis of money, but the innovation was you basically put that gold in a big old box, and you keep that box nice and safe, and then you create an avatar or a stand-in for that gold in the world, mm-hmm. and that was paper. Right. So you create this gold-backed system. And so if you want to put some timelines to it, the sort of the gold system was from like antiquity. Wait, so a, is bartering the first system? Maybe, so you sure. said there are three movements. I'm just well, trying to uh, um, there's prob- bartering is probably the, the pre-movement. So that, uh, uh, whatever okay. came before the gold system, whether it, was, whether it was the bartering system or whether it was some sort of like everything is negotiated around like agricultural future contract system, um, whatever the pre-history system was, I don't know. I don't, so maybe there was four. And there was one pre-history system, we wouldn't call it the barter system. But then you had this gold system and that's basically from antiquity up into around the heyday of the paper system. I tend to put it around the 1700s, um, 1600s, 1700s. Is when gold stopped? No, it's you no know, gold didn't stop. Um, but you, you but, but you it moved had to paper. it moved you where you had gold. You still had gold, so nations still had to have a reserve of gold, but they were no longer moving gold around. Um, merchants were no longer doing transacting sales in gold. They were transacting sales in paper. And that paper had a promise attached to it that that paper was good for a certain amount of gold or silver. So let's give you an example of England. Um, um, the reason it's called the British pound is because at some point you could exchange one British pound for a pound of silver. Hmm. And that was the exchange. A um, whole pound of silver? Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, I mean, it's not that much. A pound is, I mean, it was expensive, yeah. That, you don't think a pound of, how much is a pound of silver worth? Uh, C- continue, I'll, A pound I'll of silver, how much, how many ounces in a pound? 16. Uh, so you would, it, it would be like, what's 20 times 16? Whatever, $20 is an ounce. 320? Yeah. So $320 is a pound of silver? It's kind of a lot. Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> So you devise this system where every nation had a would have a, have a set amount of gold or a gold or silver, depending, um, sitting in a bank somewhere, sitting in a vault, and then you would have you would create an amount of paper that was a representative of that gold, mm-hmm. uh, and so then the nation had to keep the thing in balance. So you now sort of had this two you had the you, you had um, a gold system and you had a paper system. So in the United States. You had the sort of two-railed system where you could buy and sell things with silver coins and gold coins, or you could buy things with with um, uh, U.S. dollars. And the government made a promise that I think I think it was um, thirty U.S. dollars could get you an ounce of gold. I think that's what it was. Yeah, some, yeah. Um, in there. Yeah. And so now you enter this new game. So you have this technological innovation. And so paper money backed to gold solved a lot of problems. Let's think through it. So what are the problems that it solves? Um, That one around like storing that much gold. It's easier to store paper. Um, So it's the storage plus like the transportability of it. That's right. Definitely the transportability. If your ship sinks and it was like filled with banknotes of the sp- of your of the British crown, you can so reprint the banknotes. That sucks for you. You're out the money, but the system's not going to be out the paper like right. it was if the gold sank, right. because the Bank of England could be like, "Well, we just lost basically a million dollars of paper, but we still have the gold, so we'll just print the paper." And now the system is not going to be deflationary in that way because right. we can we can make the money again. Right. That's right. Okay. Yeah, transportability. Easier to break it down into like pieces. Of, again, instead of having to like melt down your gold, totally, you can just you get yep. uh, like cents for the dollar, right? It is easier to do bigger projects because yeah. it's easier to. Um, it is easier to have cash. to transport cash or even to have promissory notes about cash. Um, it makes um, 
uh, all of a sudden you can, uh, uh, when you have things tied to paper, you can do derivatives off of that paper a lot easier. So you can have a thing like a bond that pays out a note, right. uh, pays out a coupon in a way that was harder to do when you were doing that with actual physical gold. Um, but it does mean that you c- that you're basically you've moved from um, a show me the actual gold game right. to you're now in a bit of a confidence game. Right. Because, and you've moved from a system that is more of a deflationary system to a move that is very easily inflationary because... If more dollars are printed. If more dollars are printed. But you need the gold to back up the dollars. Not necessarily. You could say you have it and Uh, you don't. Okay. Right? So that's the confidence game. Just like in Faust when they do that, they tell the king... Issue issue paper money saying that the gold is in the ground and all we have to do is go and fish it out of there mm-hmm. and that's easy. Yeah. So the gold the paper is obviously worth something and then eventually people want their gold and they can't fish it that's out of right. the ground. So you have this confidence game where you as a nation say, well, at any point you can come and you can take your French francs or your British pounds or your American dollars and we're going to give you an equivalent of a gold coin or an ounce of gold or a pound of silver or whatever, yeah. and. You and then the population and the, and the world can kind of run with that confidence, but then you get into the point where then you start getting panics, and you get these kind of financial panics that you never really had in the ancient world. You would get panics where, um, where you could change the game, you could change the ratio. Well, we said before, actually, I think for a long time the U.S. was twenty three dollars an ounce, and then they were like, well, actually, it's going to be thirty dollars an ounce. People were like, whoa, do not like where this is going. So that, was that the one that one of them is when FDR is president, and it's like this huge event. He confiscates the yeah. gold during. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Um, Wait, what did he do? He changed the exchange rate, right? He, of gold. FDR to, during the Great Depression or lead up to the Great Depression changes the exchange rate of what gold is from I think twenty three dollars an ounce to thirty dollars an ounce, and People start freaking out. And when that happens, well, there's going to be less confidence in the paper and more confidence in the gold. Right. And so people start, like, trying to find as much gold as they can. And then FDR ends up confiscating um, gold and paying a fixed amount for that gold by force. And people are still salty about it. Old people are still salty really? about it. Um, I would have been. Yeah. yeah. That's ridiculous. And um, there's it's, it has this, like, cool name, like, Order 1066, like almost like Palpatine or something. I think something. it's 6102. 6102. Yeah. Um, and it was a, it was a confiscation of, of uh, private citizens' gold um, under the guise of bringing stability to the financial system. So yeah. this is in the, in the early 20th century. Jeez. And this is before we get to the new system, but this is sort of, those are the... Um, I would have been super cranky. Yes, people are, yeah, super cranky about that. Forbidden yeah, the hoarding of gold. Correct. That's crazy. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, but anyway, so you have some problems with this system. <laughs> yes. The problem is, is that you've now moved society into a bit of a confidence game. You now, the government says, we have this much gold and we're totally good for it. Um, and we, but you can print paper and you can get into this problem where, um, Governments could print paper based on the hypothetical gold they could be getting. And this is what happened. This is what bankrupt, bankrupted France um, before the French Revolution. You had a Scotsman named John Law who became the, the, prim, who became the, the financial head of France. Uh, he was a notorious gambler. Um, <laughs> and he ended up being the basically like the prime minister of France. And he convinced... He, he, he created a stock, a joint stock company called the Louisiana Company, and he convinced everybody that, hey, Louisiana, he actually owned a third of the United States of America. The France okay. owned basically this like Louisiana the, all the way up to Montana, which essentially. Louisiana purchased this, territory. Oh, uh, yes. Um, and he convinced the world that, hey, there's a lot of good stuff over there, um, so, which we're basically good for. Yeah. We haven't monetized it yet, but we're going to. Yeah. Um, and so since we're going to, I am going to create um, – the shares of this company are basically going to be good for all of those resources that exist in Louisiana. Um, and people were willing to pay whatever they wanted for the shares of that company. He then had that company end up being the entire government – basically, like, turned the shares of a company into the currency of France. Oh, okay. Um, and then – when it turned out that the colony of Louisiana was not producing the goods as fast as people wanted, everybody dumped their shares and it bankrupted the, the nation of France. <laughs> and 60 years later, the king lost his head. Wow. Um, those kinds of crazy things could not have happened yeah. in the gold system. Right. When you have this paper system that's tied to a hunk, a hunk of gold, 
real or theoretical, right. um, and then you have derivatives that you can derive from those from that paper with with like a joint stock companies. Um, uh, you end up getting these sort of like these sort of silly things like that. So you have the mismanagement of France. You can have this massive blow up, um, or you can have England, who actually manages their paper money really well and ties it well to their the storehouses that they have of currency. But doesn't even, it also limit the wealth growth of the nation? Like we have to have the gold yes. in order to issue the money. You still have the incentive for conquest. You still have right. embedded into right. the entire system the need to go and secure the underlying thing which Big is gold and silver. Gold. Yeah, yeah. So you st- so you still ha- so this is you have the British Empire needing to go and having India and taking over India and a lot of the Caribbean. And so you still have a, uh, a, a monetary system that incentivizes um, the securing of goods around the world. Um, even more so because if you've printed a lot of paper that the people don't know it, but we know that we actually don't have as much gold as we say we do. And if everybody came and exchanged their paper for silver and gold, we don't have enough to do it. Hot dang, boys, we need to go get some more gold if we're going to keep this the, the balance of this thing and the confidence of society afloat. So you've moved from, like, physical gold to this two-pronged system where all of a sudden the confidence in the system ends up being a factor that we didn't really need as – which wasn't really as much a factor in the, in the, the Boolean – the gold system from before – and so this opens up whole new realms of thought about like market confidence, and now you get into psychology, and now um, um, you get into um, um, thinking about well, how do groups of people act? Because if we can figure out how groups of people act, you know that all of a sudden is a factor that we need to factor into the confidence that we have in our system, right? So you just it opens up, um, uh, it gives incentive for going down those different kinds of like schools of human interaction mm-hmm. because it's, you've now got a system that, that, um, that uh, is predicated on a lot of confidence. Um, there are tremendous benefits we've talked about, and there's drawbacks. Inflation being one of those drawbacks is that um, some people learn the hard way that you can't – that at some point confidence breaks, and if you print too much paper and you don't have the gold to back it up, all of a sudden people lose total confidence in that paper, and uh, they hoard the gold or they get – they they turn their paper into gold and get their gold out of that country. So, like, right. so you, um, the, you have uh, new problems, and, and that is um, definitely one of them. And you still have the incentive for nations to, to try to get the gold from other people. Um, uh, there's arguments to be made that, you know, a lot of uh, why Germany became a belligerent power in the 20th century is that they were definitely behind the curve when it came to being a colonial power. Mm-hmm. They only have one kind of good harbor in the north, um, so they're not going to be a maritime power like England was or like France could be um, uh, or like the Dutch could be. Um, so they're behind the eight ball when it comes to being a colonial power. Well, when they're behind the eight ball uh, and France and England have become these big colonial powers and they are all of a sudden reaping the benefits of having a global economy as opposed to a local economy – um, and Germany sees their power waning, well, then they say, you know, th- this is an argument that can be made for the militarization of Germany in the, in the later 19th century, earlier 20th century. Same kind of argument can be made for Japan. Um, Japan being a closed society for a long time that didn't have a lot of natural resources, especially as technological advances happened. They didn't have a lot of iron ore during the Industrial Revolution. They don't have any oil. Uh, during the the new petroleum uh, revolution. And so, you know, um, they now need to – and they've never had a uh, a colonial empire. Well, they now see the need – well, our our maybe very existence is threatened if we don't have uh, – if we can't go out and get more resources and gold on top of that. So you still have – when you have a system tied to a – that physical thing – there is going to be that incentive for, for conquest, for war. And then we live, and then we move over into this third system that we have. 
And the third system that we have is we now have a system that is no longer tied to gold. That So that gold standard ended in 1973, 71, one. where Richard Nixon uh, severed the gold standard of the United States. Um, and so we are now in a system right now where the, uh, the money of the world is no longer tied to a physical asset. So, so what are our, our eras? We have the... So we got the gold, gold standard, the gold era. So the gold era, the, and, and then we have the gold standard era. No, then we, yeah, the gold standard era, you can, you can call it like the paper-backed era. Okay. So they, the, uh, you, you have paper backed by gold. Okay, so and the gold now, era, the paper-backed era. And now we would have the fiat era, the era where we have paper that is no longer backed by one thing. It's now an open question. You can either say it's backed by everything. <laughs> you could say it's backed by nothing except confidence. Or you could say it's backed by the might of the United States Navy. Um, do, we, do we call this the pothead era? Because it's always like, it's, money's not even a thing, Money's man. not even a thing. It's not worth anything. Uh, it, it's the fiat era. I mean, so, okay. <laughs> which I know by calling it the fiat era, it makes me sound like... like crypto bro. Crypto like bro, yours, which yeah. is stupid. Okay. Uh, I, I've actually come around and I think crypto's dumb. I'm going to put that out there. What? Yeah, I do. That's funny. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I don't think it, it's going to work. I don't think it's going to last. Maybe that's an in between. We can talk about it in the in between. Yeah, I've lost confidence in, in in crypto projects. Okay, let me give you a defense for sort of the system that we're in now. And this is you know, um, so um, after World War II, um, the, there was only one functioning economy that came out, a modern economy that came out unscathed, an industrialized economy, and that was the United States. Europe was decimated. England had spent all of its, basically, all of its colonial power barely surviving World War I and, and, and choking to death the, the World War I Germany and barely survived World War II. They had spent all of their blood and treasure. Um, France was decimated. Germany was definitely decimated. Uh, Russia is behind the curve on becoming a major industrial power. At, uh, Japan was destroyed. At the end of World War II, the United States is the only game in town when it comes to a, an economy. Um, and the United States makes a decision at that point. Um, they, uh, they, have, they, they entered the war having essentially a crappy navy, and they end the war having the world's strongest navy. Um, and the United States makes a decision at the end of the war. And the decision is, um, we don't want another conflict like this. Um, and we think that the way to keep a third world conflict from happening is we, if we secure the ocean in order to have trade be as safe and easy as possible. This was an ideological position that the United States took at the end of World War II. Um, um, some people, you know, there's some historians that look at it and say that it was a very high-minded position for the United States. Some people look at it and say it was, uh, it was a, a sort of a cynical uh, thing that the United States was, was playing a winning hand. It's probably somewhere in between. I, I, th I think there was a lot of high-minded individuals that looked at the end of World War II and said, we have the opportunity to put a high-minded ideal of – uh, by basically putting stock in trade. And if we can guarantee that trade can happen seamlessly and easily, we can keep a Germany from needing to attack neighbors for space and resources. If Germany can actually um, trade for the things that they don't have, they don't need to militarize to go and take for the things that they don't have. Um, and so the United States basically said, then they had another, and then they also had the, the enemy, they had this new enemy of communism, of, of, the, of the Iron Curtain coming down. And they also saw that if we can have a sphere of influence that has the freedom of trade, we can create a system where we can hopefully limit the need for conflict because there, you can, there, is, a, there is a financial way out of the conflict. And we can, um, uh, and, we, and so we can maybe enrich ourselves and also in, in, in rich nations. So this is, and we will, we will affect this by the force that we have an uncontested global naval power. And essentially the United States did this. If you play by um, the U.S. rules, in essence, if you let us um, um, 
basically dictate your military policy regarding the Soviet Union, let us have bases, uh, and, and you are on our side and you join NATO or whatever, um, we will guarantee your trade even if your trade doesn't materially benefit the United States. So all of a sudden, you can have South Africa shipping us a boatload of copper to Brazil, and it is going to be protected by the United States Navy. And the United States is not, they're not taking a cut. They're not like saying, we'll do this, but you got you know, you got to pay us like mobsters. Like, you know, that's a nice copper boat you got. It's a shame if anything were to happen to it. No, um, they're not taking a cut on this, but they are securing that shipping from happening insofar as those nations are sort of playing ball with this free trade, free world that the United States envisions after World War II. Okay, so that, that's one side of it. Um, and if you don't, well, then you can play the Russia game and there's no guarantees of what's going to happen. And there's a lot of nations that went with the Russia game. Um, the, so then the big question is, okay, why did Nixon then feel confident that he could get off the gold standard? Well, when you had that system set up where you basically had nations that were guaranteed um, a safe trade, um, uh, eventually people gravitated towards settling those transactions with the United States dollar. And the reason being, so imagine, let's use our example of South, Amer South Africa. You're South Africa and you bought a bunch of copper and you're wanting to sell copper to Brazil. You're like, you call them up, you're like, hey, Brazil, I hear you want some copper. We got some copper. What do you got for us? And the Brazil's like, what, what's the Brazilian currency? Um, it's not the real, is it? Is it the real? Let me find out. Um, and Brazil's like, hey, we will buy that real. copper for a bunch of Brazilian real. Well, South Africa, the only reason South Africa would take Brazilian real is if there was something from Brazil they wanted later. And that's possible. Maybe they're like, fine, we'll do it. Um, or South Africa could say, um, you could do it with gold. That's another way to do it. Or they could say, um, uh, would, you, would you buy our currency and then... Would you like keep a reserve of our South African currency and then buy our copper with that? And Brazil's like, I guess. But then you got to print the currency just to sell it, just to buy it back. And that does that's not a net benefit for South Africa. And so basically it's like as time goes on and as trade becomes easier, these nations are like, listen, can you do, do you have like U.S. dollars? Yeah, we have U.S. dollars. OK, let's just settle it in that because they know that they can take those U.S. dollars and they can trade with America. They can trade with anybody over time because the United States was offering – that was the safest game because they, they were the safety of the seas. And so over time, trade ended up gravitating towards being settled in U.S. dollars up to the point where even today, today, the amount – of global transactions that are settled, that are U.S. denominated, oh. is 80% of global trade is denominated in the U.S. dollar. That is insane. That means that every, that's not like number of transactions, that's the, the overall oh, total volume of transactions. So that means that if you are South Africa and you're building a nuclear power plant and you're buying all that stuff, you are probably doing all of those deals in the U.S. dollar, even if you're buying nothing from the U.S., mm. So that all of a sudden the United States gets in this point where the entire world needs the United States dollar. Right. Everybody needs the U.S. dollar. Okay, go back to the U.S. The U.S. has their dollar tied to the amount of gold that they have. And the world is crying out for the U.S. dollar because it is the easiest way to settle their international trade that is now easy and safe to do because of the U.S. Navy. Um, and you have these nations that are going to buy as much – get their hands on as much U.S. dollars as they can. So the United States dollar knows that for every dollar they print, there is somebody who needs it in the world. There is a market that can absorb that U.S. dollar. But if you have your currency tied to a, mount, to a big hunk of gold – and people are crying out for the U.S. dollar, you now have this new strain in your system that because you basically have a fixed amount of gold and you have a massive global demand for the U.S. dollar for this new trade um, paradigm that's existed, that's never existed in history before. Mm -hmm. And so you get to this point where Nixon basically, I don't know if Nixon realizes it, but you get to this point where 
you can sever the United States dollar from the gold standard and let gold trade for whatever it's going to trade to. And gold went from famously $30 an ounce to $800 an ounce in like a decade wow. after the gold standard. Yeah, she was canceled. But and everybody was thinking, oh, my goodness, it's going to be inflation, inflation, inflation. The United States is going to print all this money and it's not tied to anything. Who's going to buy this? Who's going to believe in this? But the world is is doing the vast majority of its trade in the U.S. dollar. The world is absorbing all of the dollars that are put out there. Because it's backed by a bullet, not backed by Cause it's gold. Because b- it's backed by the safety and sa- of this system. Right. So right. it's backed by the fact that, that you're, you can pl- – it's basically backed on the fact that you can plan. You can plan that your copper is going to go from South Africa to Brazil – with a, with a degree of certainty that you could not plan when it was the age of pirates on the high seas, right? right? And you're sending, a, you're sending like sugar from, from uh, the Caribbean to France and like a British boat's going to blast it out of, and, and right. steal it. Like all of a sudden that, that injects a certain dynamic into trade that is now gone because you can almost guarantee by clockwork that um, – as, as boats get, you know, are, are no longer sus- as susceptible to weather events, you can guarantee that trade. We got to the point where before COVID, we could have just-in-time shipping, mm-hmm. which meant that you could um, not have to keep, like Amazon didn't even need to keep like storehouses of things. Like you could, anyway, I don't, I don't know how just-in-time shipping works logistically, but it's essentially um, the well, system imagine. was so predictable yeah. that you could, uh, you didn't have to build redundancies into the system. The classic example is you're building a laptop, but the, the components for that laptop come from across the world. You can ship that, that product in progress around the world, and as it gets there, the next piece that it needs is ready, and then you keep moving it on. You don't, mm-hmm. need, you don't need any inventory. Yes. Right? And are, so we, you, are we still policing the high seas? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, there's, okay. there's no um, – and, and there's no – we haven't – I mean, there are – So my life is piracy is not really going to Your life piracy is not going to happen. Uh, um, I'm sorry. But there's one possible career down the drain. Sorry. So the United States almost like, f- like um, accidentally fumbles its way into this system where there is such demand for the global dollar that they can safely decouple it from gold without – the confidence game going away, and now the rest of the world basically controls their currency with a reserve of dollars as opposed to their currency with a reserve of gold. So in many ways, the rest of the world is still on that middle system. They have their real, they have their, 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 their currency, and it is in relationship to the dollar and the United States is in this weird system where they have their system, they have the dollar, and they have the fact that the world is used – the world basically runs on the operating system of the dollar. And so that has meant that the United States can run budget deficits um, and without inflation because that money is going to be absorbed by the global system because there's always going to be people that need that to function. So there's not there was there has not been a point where people are like, "Oh man, there's just too much United States dollars in there. We don't need this garbage." And then the purchasing power rapidly goes away. Now, we're living through a period of inflation right now and that's kind of a different a different situation. But um um the United States kind of um in the system that we're in now We've yeah we've created this this system where everybody uses the United States dollar. It's like the operating system. It's like the the computer operating system that won, yeah. and it's too much of a pain in the butt to try to port over to some completely different system. It's too expensive. You would need to you would need everybody to be true believers in the new system and accept a lot of like loss of potential wealth before the before the other system got enough sort of like flywheel momentum to, su- to supplant the United States dollar. Um, and so you've, you've kind of um, – um, that free trade system that was born out of we want to make sure that global wars don't happen, so we are going to make trade as easy as possible. And this is sort of like the Milton Friedman. Uh, he's like the acolyte. or He's like the big – you know, the evangelist of the free trade model. Um, um, basically, the United States – fumbled its way into this position where their dollar ended up being the 
the uh, settlement rail for the world. Um, and so that – it meant that there was going to be a break with a gold back system eventually. It, it, like, it, it became this thing where it was kind of an absurd thing. Um, the, the other fact is like we don't even know how many U.S. dollars there are in the world, right? Like if you are a French bank and you loan American dollars to a Belgian business and they promise to pay you back in U.S. dollars – well, those dollars need to exist at the time that they're paying you back. And like when you make – when you basically enter a credit agreement, you have created an asset and a liability. Mm -hmm. But that asset that's created, the amount of money may or may not exist, right? Like if AJ says, hey, I'll sell you my light phone for a thousand trillion dollars and I agree to that um, – AJ has to find a thousand – I have to find a thousand trillion dollars to pay AJ. Well, that money doesn't exist, so this deal is eventually not going to work. But, um, but we don't know how many – like the thing is when it comes to, when it, when it comes to people who are, are issuing credit, um, it, it creates you know, uh, hypothetical dollars out there that need to be paid back in the future. So – if the, the United States, if they wanted to keep their money on the gold standard, they actually don't even know how much promised United States dollars exists in the world. So they, there was going to be a break at some point. It, it, it couldn't, there was not enough gold in the world to, um, or it, it didn't have to, cause it couldn't be just the money that currently exists. It has to be the money that's currently existent and the money that's promised to pay back a lot that's of those right. things. Let's say that you and I came into an agreement uh, for a business venture, and I promised that I was going to pay you a million dollars over the next 10 years for this, and you gave me the money now to do it. And let's just say that that money, the United States just, there was no more million dollars. That money was gone. Um, and I can do the problem, I can do the venture, you've given me the money, but there's like, I can't even go into the world and find a million dollars to pay you for it. And I go to the United States government, or I go to the, the government, I say, hey, if you don't put more U.S. dollars in the world, things are going to grind to a halt. And then the U.S. – so the U.S. says, OK, well, we can put money into the world. Let's put money into the world. And so things can go again. Well, if you do that but your money's tied to gold, then you're going to have to like – deflate a little bit. Yeah, so you're going to have to basically – Or have to find it, more gold. It no longer makes sense to have your currency tied to the physical rock of gold because um, if everybody is using the dollar – to be useful in the world, arbitrarily tying it to a set amount of money is no longer a, a thing that needs to happen. So it's essentially tied to the might of the nation. So it's tied to the might of the nation and it's tied to the sort of the, the agreement. It, it, it basically like stumbled its way into being the operating system of the global economy. And that rubs some people the wrong way. And people, who, and then, you know, um, it does mean that like when the United States makes a decision about their dollar, it affects the rest of the world. When Canada makes a decision about the Canadian dollar, nobody in Texas cares. Right. But when as long as it's named something cool like a loony or a dooney. That's right. Yeah. You guys have great dollar names. We got some great dollar, dollar names. sounds silly. Yours sound amazing. Lo loonies and toonies. But when the when the Federal Reserve or when the F American government makes some sort of decision about the about how much U.S. dollars are in the world, that can have a material effect on. Uzbekistan. And all of a sudden, Uzbekistan's like, well, crap. And so that can rub yeah, we were basing wrong, our right? currency on your dollars. Now they're worth less because you printed a whole bunch of them. Or they're worth more English. and our purchasing power has gone down. You know, like it can – so that can rub people the wrong way. That, 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 it can cause nations around the world to feel like they are under this power that they have no say in. Okay. That they have a um, – that they have decisions that are materially affecting their lives and they have um, no enfranchisement in that system, right? Um, uh, Washington's making decisions and all of a sudden it is causing um, food prices in Libya to go up and, and that is, you know, like, and, and that can be, over time that can, that can create a, you know, grumpy views towards, towards the U.S. Uh, because the United States will make decisions that, benefit the U.S. They have maybe political expediency decisions they need to make. Um, and um, uh, during COVID, the United States pours in a ton of money into the system to keep the thing going. But that's got these like tail whip effects 
when you put in lots of United States dollars, it can have all these sort of tail whip effects on nations that are really sensitive to the amount of dollars in the system, you know, and they don't have a say in that. Right. And that, but that can have a, that can have real life or death consequences for their country. And that can really benefit, that can really, um, it doesn't uh, feel good. Um, it doesn't is, feel there, good. is there a way we can, uh, maybe this is for the in-between episode. Is sure. there a way that we could have like a voting system for the other countries so they get a little enfranchisement? I, I doubt it. Um, I don't know. Never thought about it. Uh, probably it'd, not. It'd be an easy way to solve sort of that bitterness. Um, well, you do have things like you have uh, you have international monetary policy groups. So you have things like the G seven, right? Uh, and you have things like um, uh, yeah, you you have uh, um, like what happens in Davos. What's that? Uh, you've you've got the, all of world, the central banks that come together to talk Economic about Forum. monetary policy, oh, the World yeah. Economic Forum. Yep. That helps. Um, so you, ha- you do have those, those sorts of mechanisms. But so we're in that system right now that we've kind of stumbled into. Now, and the other thing is, is that this system has more or less incentivized peace. Now, I know it's a controversial thing to say, but if you are a small fledgling nation um, if you're a second world power, you have an, you have an incentive to play ball with the global system, um, uh, more so than you have an incentive to, mo- to militarize and go off because if America, if that is a impediment to the sanct- the, to the safety of trade, well, now all of a sudden you've got the entire, um, might of the U S army. That's like, Hey, you're making, you're, you're making it difficult for everybody else. And so if you run afoul of that, um, uh, then, you know, there, there is, there is a, a bit of, uh, of an incentive for nations to get on board with the global financial system that's backed by the U S dollar. A great example is that is, is look at the nations when they came out of the fall of the Soviet union, the nations that kind of got on board to the U S dollar backed system have been the ones that have come out of communism and flourished. Poland is probably the best example. Um, uh, what, ha- how, what Poland went from under communism to what Poland is now, um, 30 years later is, is the great example of them sort of embracing the game. Now you can hate the game. You can not love the system. You can say like, this has the problems where if nations feel like they are disenfranchised and, and I, and I, and I agree. Um, but it has been the system that has kind of, um, uh, at least my reading of it, it is something that the United States kind of stumbled its way into after World War II um, as a like, well, we don't want this kind of thing to happen again. What's going to keep it from happening? Well, safe, free trade. And then over time, that has solidified into the U.S. dollar being the, mean, the, the, the means of exchange and the, and, the, and the settlement rail for the world. And that has meant that you sort of have this, glo- they call it the, glo- the, the dollar wrecking ball. You have the dollar um, be this, um, this, the, the, the operating system of the world. But, uh, but there are ways in which that's really good. A oh, small totally. country like Poland that could not otherwise protect their boats against the pe- people who are throwing a lot of weight around, right? They get to participate in, in free trade and flourish, even though they don't have the military to necessarily yeah. say our boats are going to go to your port and they're going to go safely. In the ancient world, if a small nation like Poland was part of a dissolved empire, they were going to get taken over by the empire next to them. Yeah. But in this world, when Poland comes out of a dissolved empire of the Soviet Union, you have, an, you have a world being like, hey, we'll trade with you, right? And so, um, and so... Like, welcome to the party. We're glad you're here. Yeah. Now, in a sense, you could look at that and say that the only way that Poland is going to stay alive is if Poland, like, allows themselves to be colonized into this global system. Right. But Pushed if, you, if the, the alternative is... Um, integration into the global economy or integration into uh, a belligerent empire that's stronger than you. Yeah. I mean, those are, those are, those are decisions that, that usually you, you would opt for the one that you t- retain some kind of autonomy, right. autonomy of, of country. Yeah. Um, even though you are, yeah, you are going to be beholden to the system. Um, and, and but that, at least you can make your own laws, right? Yeah, There's, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, so that is real quick and dirty framework of talking about sort of like monetary eras. And if you can sort of place those monetary eras and, and have them in the back of your mind as you're studying different eras of history, 
they help organize and understand various things. Like it's not just that everyone loved Rousseau and that's why they cut the king's head off. Mm -hmm. It's that you also were bankrupt six years ago and you have those realities as well. It's not that America has become this sort of um, bloodthirsty colonizing force that took over the world after World War II. No, I mean, we sort of stumbled into this, into this, um, this game where it was just easier for the world to trade in the U.S. dollars, be protected by the U.S. Navy, and, um, and there was sort of that rising tide uh, thing. And in fact, it, and that, that system defeated communism. Right. It wasn't like we had, I don't know, like strong family values and the godless Russians didn't. No, it was because we had um, uh, this global system that no amount of central planning was ever going to compete with. Right. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> that yes. was a lot. Anyway. I like it. Yeah, that was, that was awesome. Uh, this has been Classical Stuff You Should Know. This is AJ Graham and Thomas. Um, you can check out our website, classicalstuff.net. You can find us pretty much anywhere podcasts are happening. And it turns out you probably already found us because <laughs> you're listening. Uh, you can also find us on Patreon, patreon.com slash classical stuff. You can tweet at us at CLSSCAL stuff. You can email us at theguys at classical stuff.net. Or, you know, send fives our way and we'll, might, we might pick them up. Try, fives? Try. Five, like $5 bills? Yeah. You can do that too. But send, I mean, send, send yeah. vibes. We'll yeah. try to get your vibes. You know, who knows how much that works. So send some vibes, send some, whatever you want to do. Mm-hmm. We're, we're glad you're here and uh, glad you're listening. Although you're probably not listening to this part. Most people turn it off before now. Mm, I don't true. think that's true. You think we should give like little nuggets of wisdom here at yeah. the end? We should give like a fact, oh. like a shark fact? I got one. Yeah. What's a cool um, fact? So people who've listened to the end will hear that there was a... Um, uh, there was an old uh, Canadian beer campaign where we used to sell a bucket of beer. Okay. Um, and the jingle was beer, 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 bucket of beer, 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 beer. All you need is a fiver and a sober driver. Beer, 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 bucket of beer. And this was an actual campaign. I love that in Canada, part of the campaign yeah. is road safety. Road safety. <laughs> Saber drive. So you, have, you have to like bring the money, but also, you know, it, be, be responsible. It yeah. costs five bucks. And all you need is a driver. All you need is a fiver and a sober driver. And you got yourself a bucket of beer, my friend. All right. Should we should we sing it out? No, no. No. <laughs> no? You guys don't want to sing that out? No? I think Graham already did. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye. Fair enough. Bye. Beer, 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 bucket of beer, 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 beer. All you need is a fiver and a sober driver. Beer, 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 beer bucket of beer. I, I convinced them to do this, and they I think they reluctantly agreed. Oh, I did not reluctantly agree. I agreed wholeheartedly. It was Thomas who I was reluctant. Thomas was reluctant for, for, for sure. No, Grant was reluctant. Grant.